Hi everyone, I'm Rosemary, and if you like high-end decor dupes, then this is the video for you. In this video, I've compiled 30 DIY dupes of beautiful pieces from stores like Restoration Hardware, Pottery Barn, H&M, Magnolia, Anthropology, and West Elm, with most of the materials used purchased from Dollar Tree. This is a long form compilation video, but you can find an index as well as the links to all the original videos in the description box below. But for this video, I'm going to kick things off with the most popular video of this series, Restoration Hardware. And for the first project, I will be doing a dollar dupe replica of their etched concrete vase retailing for $95. For this project, I'm going to use one of the large Dollar Tree cylinder vases, as well as some Dollar Tree caulk, and I'm going to cut the caulk down pretty low on the nozzle because I want to be able to get it out pretty quickly. I also need a bowl of water, a spreader for the caulk, and then just a comb that I cut in half. So I'm going to just take the vase that I did clean and prepare for this project. And then I'm going to just, like I mentioned, slather on that caulk. And then I'll just take my spreader and spread it all around, get a nice even coat all over the vase. And then to get rid of those ridges, I'll just dip my fingers in some water and just spread that right over the top of the caulk. And it'll give me a nice, even smooth finish. And also do that around the top of the vase as well. Next, I took the larger piece of my comb and just went right into the caulk with the comb, pulling it around and through the caulk. Now, it'd be good if I did have some paper towel there. I did go and get some later on, but uh, be sure to have some paper towel handy to clean the comb so that you don't have caulk buildup and you're able to get those nice clean ridges. Now for each row that I do, I do have a designated start and stop spot so that all of the kind of off pace is in the back of the vase. And then once I had created all my little ridges, I went back with some sand. I got this from the Dollar Tree. It's from another project, so that's why it's in a little regular plastic bag. And I'm just sprinkling it all around, just creating a nice texturized finish. Then uh, to make sure that the vase will stand up straight and I won't have any issues, I did go back and make sure everything was cleaned on the bottom. Once the caulk was dry, it was time to paint. And my first choice for paint was to use Waverly in the color steel. And then I just went ahead and added about a tablespoon of water to thin the paint out a little bit. I just wanted to make sure that the paint was nice and thin so that it would get in between all the lines on the vase. And here you can see how that thinned out paint allows you to do that. And I just used the sponge brush to kind of get it uh, into the, those little crevices with the tip. And then I just began kind of just squashing it down into uh, the crevices and making sure I filled all those little gullies. I was in the process of doing or preparing the paint for the top coat. And I realized that the base coat really wasn't the right color. So I stopped doing this and switched over to create a new base coat. And then here's my new color choice. It is now instead Waverly in the color mineral with a drop of black chalk paint. Also, I did add again, a tablespoon of water and I will save you from watching me paint again and just show you through the magic of television. Here you see the new colored vase. And now let's get back to where we jumped off and back to the accent paint. And so for that, I'm going to be using the ivory Waverly paint. I also added a drop of the mineral Waverly paint as well to just kind of dull it down a bit. I don't want that stark contrast between the two different paint colors. And to apply this coat, I'm going to be using a makeup sponge and all I'm doing is gently going on top of the ridges uh, made by the caulk and just gently applying the paint there. And I'll do that all the way around the vase. And then here you can see the finished project next to the original. And as you can see, the dollar dupe is a little smaller, but you can always do the same technique on a larger vase to get something much more comparable to the restoration hardware piece. Now the color I think still needs a little tweaking, so you might wanna work on that one as well. Up next is the Weathered Stone Flared Pedestal Bowl, retailing for $225. 
For this next project, I'm going to be using a selection of Dollar Tree bowls, including this serving bowl from the party section and these two plastic bowls. The larger one comes in a set that's two for a dollar and the smaller one is in a set three for a dollar. I'll also be using some more of the caulk and I'm going to just add some caulk there to the bottom of the small bowl and then take the larger bowl and place the two back to back. Then I'm going to add some caulk again to the inside of that larger bowl and then just place the large serving bowl right inside making sure that it is straight and even. And then once the caulk was set and all the pieces were secured together I took some more caulk and this time I wanted to use it as filler between the bowls. And then to smooth out the caulk and get a nice sleek finish, I just again dip my fingers in some water and then just smooth the caulk around. And then I just repeated the process for the space between the mid and bottom bowl. Once that round of caulk was set, I went back and covered the entire piece with a layer of Mod Podge. And then once that is dry, I'll be painting with a mixture of Waverly chalk paint in the color Mineral and some Dollar Tree Spackle, and I will be mixing those in a ratio of one to one. And I will be painting three coats of this mixture onto the piece. And then here is what the piece looks like after I have painted it with three coats of the Mineral Spackle paint. And then for the accent paint, I'm going to be using a mixture of white chalk paint and spackle in a one-to-one -one ratio again. And I want to tone it down again with a little bit of the mineral paint as well. To apply the accent paint, I'm going to use a makeup wedge. And at first I'll be using the back square part and then dip that in the paint, removing any excess, and then just begin pouncing that on the surface of the bowls. I'm going to do this heavier in some places and then lighter in others to keep with the pattern of the original. I'll use the front edge of the wedge to get into the little cracks and crevices between the bowls. In addition to the makeup sponge, I also used one of the chip brushes from the Dollar Tree. And I found that that actually mimicked the pattern and the detailing of the original better, but I still liked the makeup sponge for getting the texture right on the piece. For the darker accents, I'm going to use some dark brown craft paint and just add that to my original base mixture to create a dark accent paint. And then I'm going to just again use a makeup sponge and go gently on the edges of the bowl as well as on the body of the bowl where the texture kind of peaks up. I'm just gently brushing the tops of those peaks on the texture. And then here you can see the finished project next to the original. Now the proportions of the dollar dupe are off and it's not as wide versus the height as the original and it's not as large overall as the original, but at 11 inches high and nine inches wide, it still is a pretty sizable statement piece and comes in at a fraction of the cost. For the next piece, I tried my hand at Restoration Hardware's paper mache bowl, retailing at $195. For this project, I'm again going to be using the large plastic serving bowl from the Dollar Tree. I'm also going to use some of this Dollar Tree toilet paper, and it is two ply that comes apart very easily, and I'm going to just separate it by squares. I'm then also going to remove some of the edges of those squares, so I'm just going to pull them together and then just kind of roughly take off the edges and create a little pile there so that I have a whole bunch ready to use. And I'll be attaching the toilet paper pieces to the bowl with some diluted school glue. Now, this one is actually too thin, but I'll show you that in a second. But I also wanted to show you that for the base, for the little bottom piece of the bowl, I'm going to be using the lid off of this nut jar. And I'll just put that aside for now. And then I'm going to go back to the bowl and just begin applying the glue right to the side of the bowl. And then just apply the little pieces of toilet paper right on top. And just kind of fold them over the lip of the bowl 
and continue to go down all the way around the bowl. Now, why I'm saying it's too thin, that glue, is that I needed it to be thin so that it breaks down the paper fibers, but it's too thin. And so it was tearing the paper. And so I had to go back and add some more glue. And the consistency you see there is the better consistency for this method of doing paper mache. Now I know there's all types of paper mache methods out there where you put the glue and you mix it with a mixer and you actually use the bowl just as a mold and all that good stuff. Yeah, we're, this is FabTax. We're gonna do it as easy as possible. Just go ahead and use the bowl from the Dollar Tree and it's gonna stay on there and just uh, go ahead and glue the pieces right on to the bowl itself. And then in order to make it easier to do this project and not have to hold the bowl, I just took the nut container that I'm using the lid from and placed the bowl on top of that. And then that just created a nice little work stand for me to just keep the bowl on top of. And then I'm just able to use both hands and uh, just apply the papers much more easily. And then once I had completed the first layer, I just went back with a second layer and all I needed to do was just uh, put them right onto the bowl. I didn't have to put any more glue because the first layer glue was still wet and coming through the uh, sides there. So I just needed to add that second layer and just press it right down into the glue and the first layer of paper. And then after all of the glue pieces were applied, I did go back with a second coat of the glue mixture. But um, if the paper starts tearing and you're having some trouble with that, just let that layer dry completely before going back and adding that second layer of glue. And then here is what the bowl looks like after the second layer of paper has been applied and that glue has dried. And I also did the inside of the bowl. Now the original also has this strip that goes around as well as a wider rim. To get the wider rim, I just painted the glue mixture right at the inside top of the bowl. Then I took a square of the toilet paper, attached it there, also painted along the rim itself, and began folding the piece of toilet paper, like an accordion kind of, uh, and then just brought that around and glued the outside top of the bowl and then just kind of shaped it into place. For the strip, I took a piece of toilet paper, I did leave it to ply and just rolled it up and then just kind of formed it around and I then took some of the glue mixture and applied it there in the space where it would go on the bowl. And then I simply just attach the rolled up piece of the toilet paper. For the base, I just took that cap from the nut container, which I had covered with toilet paper, and then just glued that with some E6000 right onto the base. Next, I'm going to just paint the whole piece with some hazelnut Waverly chalk paint. But then since I'm running low on my hazelnut, I did remember I had this uh, paint sample mist tint from uh, Lowe's that I picked up for $1.25, very similar in color to the hazelnut. So I just went ahead and used that. For the accent paint, I took some white chalk paint then I toned down again with some of this hazelnut-ish color, and I don't want that stark contrast, so this just helps me to tone it down a little bit and softens the white so that it's not as sharp, that contrast. And so I'm just going ahead and applying the lighter color to the surface of the bowl, and I'm just kind of hitting the spots where the paper mache kind of raises up and it just kind of gives that overcoat while still allowing the base coat to shine through. And like the other piece, it is also 
heavier in some spots, the accent coding, and lighter in others. So I'm just going through and just um, adding it lightly to the top on top of the paper mache, but also heavier in some spots and lighter in others. For the darker accent shades, I'm going to use what I had left over from the last project, as well as some of this brown craft paint. And I'm going to start with the brown craft paint. I'm going to just use again a makeup sponge. I'm going to remove uh, the better portion of the paint because I don't want to go too heavy. I want to make sure that you know I can control how much paint is going onto the surface. And I'm going to just pretty much follow the original to see where the dark shading is and where these little accents and little divots and, and scrapes are on the original piece. And um, they're coming in pretty much there along the base as well as the little strip and along the top and some scattered spots in between as well. So in addition to that, there is also a nice kind of ruddy shading. And in order to get that effect, I pretty much removed most of that brown paint from the sponge and then just use a pretty much a dry sponge to go in and just kind of shade very lightly, kind of blush the um, surface and rub it in to really just kind of mute it out. I don't want any like thick colors, just very muted, very soft tones. And then I finished up with refining the accent paint along the edges and base. And first I started with that really dark color. And I'm just kind of splotching it along using this kind of wonky paintbrush that I had. And uh, again, just doing that, uh, kind of just pouncing it along there on the edges and along the base. Then the next one I did was mineral once that paint was dry. So every time the paint needs to dry. And then this time I switched back to my uh, Dollar Tree chip brush. And I am loading this up pretty good. I want to just make sure I, I'm kind of getting some off, but I also want it fully loaded, if that makes any sense. So I don't want just some of the bristles to have paint on it. I want a full load, but not an extraordinary amount. And then I'm kind of just doing this one time pounce um, and just moving the brush then I'm going to reload it again and do the same thing. Now I'll also do this with that lighter brown color and uh, unfortunately that was not caught on film but I do three pieces of or three different types of paint uh, for these edges and it is the dark shade and then that mineral and then also that chocolate brown color shown earlier. And I'm applying them in the same method where I load the brush up pounce and move on. And then here you can see the finished project next to the original. And as you can see, they are pretty similar in size. And actually the Dollar Dupe looks more paper mache-y than the original. The original looks like it's stone or cement or something. But either way, you can certainly get that look for a lot less. For the last project, I'm going to take a stab at Restoration Hardware's Taraja Panel retailing for a whopping $315 for the short and $365 for the tall. To start, I'm going to use this shipping box from the Dollar Tree. Now, you can use any cardboard that you like. I just happened to be in Dollar Tree and saw these and couldn't believe how much they were in the size proportion that was needed for this project. So I went ahead and picked one of these up and now I'm going to just cut it into the four pieces or the four sides down into pieces. And then for the smaller ones, I'm actually going to cut those a little bit shorter. I'm going to measure down 12 inches and then mark there and then just cut across. So at this stage, I had two pieces, 14 by 10 inches and two pieces that were 12 by eight inches. My next step was to tape the two pieces together were the two pieces that were the same size together. And so I'm just going to use some masking tape and just go ahead and tape those together on three sides, leaving the bottom side open. And then I'll repeat that for the larger pieces of cardboard. Once the taping is complete, I'm going to go ahead with some Mod Podge and paint the back and front of both pieces.
Once the Mod Podge was dry, it was time to apply caulk to the surface. I'm only going to be applying caulk to the one side, but it does require two tubes of the Dollar Tree caulk for the small one and three tubes for the larger one. Once I had a good amount of the caulk onto the surface, I just took my spreader again and spread the uh, caulk all over the front of the panel. And then once I had applied a nice even coat of the caulk, I went back again with some water on my fingertips and just smoothed out the surface. To create the first design on the panel, I'm going to go back to the comb from the first DIY in this video and just go ahead and create a little feathering effect at the top and bottom of the panel. Now this is the small panel that I'm working on first and I'm just again using this comb to create a little feathering at the top and bottom. Then I'm going to go back with this shim and a little piece of wood and go ahead and create the lines that go across the shorter panel. And I'm just doing this by sight and kind of just eyeballing it and then just using that shim to create the pattern in the caulk. To give the raised lines a little texture, I'm going back with the skinny side of the shim and just kind of adding some design there to the top of the lines. And then for the larger panel, I'm again going to be doing that feather design uh, with the comb, but this time I'm going to be doing it to the sides of the panel. And um, you'll notice how I did it here and then also in the first one where I kind of just pressed it in, but then you'll see right here. I did figure out a better way to do it where I'm actually pulling the comb and uh, creating a much better design. I did go back and fix the uh, first one as well, but this is a much better way to get that feathering effect on the sides of the panels. To create the design on this panel, I took a hair pick and cut off every other prong. And then I just used that to pull down through the caulk and create the design. The larger panel also has horizontal lines, and I just again used the pick to create those. I noticed that the smaller panel also had some vertical lines and went back with the back of the comb and just created those on that panel as well. To create the stand, I'm going to use one of these cat scratch boards from the Dollar Tree and I'm going to measure down seven inches and draw a line there and then just use this paint stick here to cut down with my utility knife. At the end, I'll have one seven inch piece and one eight and a half inch. I then took some masking tape and taped off around all the edges. For the poles, I'm going to use two of the large barbecue skewers from Dollar Tree, and I'm going to measure those down with my tape measure. 17 inches and I'm going to mark and cut there. I'll also cut off those pointy ends because they are sharp. And then I broke out the caulk again and so I just placed it there on top of the cat scratch board and used my spreader to spread it along the top as well as kind of push it into all those little crevices there on the board. I also did around the sides of the board and I also want to point out that it's important to use the Dollar Tree brand caulk. I had run out of it and used some caulk that I had in my garage. Now, I don't know what the difference is, but the other one, the one from Home Depot, 
it was very flexible and so it did not create a good hold for the poles. However, the Dollar Tree brand dried hard as a rock and it created a great base. Another thing you need to do is make sure that the holes are really small, don't make too large of a hole, and that you get a lot of caulk inside the hole as well. And then let everything dry overnight and it's going to create a great base for your project. And then once the caulk was dry on my panels, it was time to paint. And so I wanted to create a base coat in kind of a terracotta color. So I took truffle and a pumpkin Waverly chalk paints and just mixed them together to create that darker orange shade. And then I just proceeded to paint both panels with a base coat of this color paint. I used the paintbrush to make sure that I got into all the little crevices in between the lines. And since the caulk was set on my stands, I took those out back for a coat of black spray paint. For the accent paint for my panels, I'm going to take some white chalk paint and then also some hazelnut colored chalk paint and mix the two together. It's about a three quarter to one quarter ratio. I then took that paint and added it to about the same amount of spackle to add some texture to my top coat. I start at first with the smaller panel, again just following the design of the original. Now the original has this kind of lighter shading in the upper left hand corner and then again in the right hand corner and then kind of lighter in the middle but or less in the middle and even when you're looking at it there's it's not going to look like it's white like this or a light light color on top. There'll be shades in between and we'll get to that. Um, in a minute, but first um, I'm going to do this layer and then we'll see how I shade on top of this. Next I'll start on the larger panel, again following the original's design. And also I'm going to be shading on top of this, but I need to get this layer of lighter colored paint on first. And then once that lighter paint was dry, I did go back with the darker shading and I'm again using that uh, dark paint from the second project actually now that I've been using for an accent paint. And I'm just going in for this first piece into those horizontal lines and then adding some other dark accents around in the different areas. Again, just following the original piece. Then I switched over to the makeup sponge and I'm using, I'm doing shading using uh, both that darker shade that I was just using on this piece as well as the uh, kind of chocolate bar brown color that I was using on the paper mache bowl. And that's when I'm just going in and using the sponge to do just a very dry brush, just kind of a smudge effect using both of those paint colors and just shading and shadowing in following the design of the original piece and just using those colors to blend and shadow and shade uh, to create this kind of wood effect. And now turning back to the smaller piece, Again, just using that chocolate brown color, very little on the sponge. I'm using the square end of the sponge and going back over uh, that lighter color paint. Again, just shadowing and shading, very similar to what the original piece has. I'm also using that darker colored paint to again mimic the spots where that those darker shades are showing up on the original piece and again just using very little paint I can go back and add more if needed 
but I just want to get that shading and kind of just blushing and rubbing that paint in uh, very lightly at first uh, just acquiring slowly that whole effect and making sure I'm not going too heavy in any spots because you want to keep that dimension of the multicolors coming through. And then once the paint was dry, I was able to now put my panel on the stand. And so here it is after it's been painted with the black spray paint. And all you need to do is just slide your posts right into the pocket of your panel and it will hold it just beautifully. Except for the fact that that stand was way too wobbly. So I wanted to add some reinforcements. And what I did was I took these little building blocks uh, they are from the Dollar Tree, you get them in the teaching section. And so I put two of these together that come as like just little pieces. Um, they're colorful. They have a couple black ones, but there's only a couple in a package. And what I'm going to do is take two of the pieces, clip them together. I did add some E6000 there first to create an extra strong bond. And then I also did some E6000 in the hole and then around the outside of the hole and then placed the little uh, building block pair down inside the hole. Then I'm going to add some of the caulk and then I'll replace my stick inside of that. And then once the glue and caulk are set, I will go ahead and touch these up with some black paint. And then here you can see the finished project next to the original. And now of course our dollar dupe is going to have that little extra bonus piece down there at the bottom. And it is about a third smaller in size than the original. But it does give that great restoration hardware vibe, especially if you have RH taste on a DT budget. And then here is one last look at the Restoration Hardware Dollar Dupes. And for the next set of projects, we will be moving on to Pottery Barn. Let's jump into this video with Project 1 and a Dollar Dupe of Pottery Barn's Artisan Hand Painted Earthenware Vase, retailing at $79. To start, I'm going to take this Dollar Tree vase that I washed and prepped. Now, this vase is 7 inches tall, and if you want to get closer to the 15 inch size of the original, you can use the same technique on a taller vase that you may have just around your house, or pick one up at a thrift store for just a few dollars. Next, I took some Dollar Tree spackle and mixed it in a 1 to 1 ratio with some craft paint in the color terracotta. Once the spackle paint was nice and smooth, I just painted it right onto the side of the vase with a little foam brush. And you'll notice that it does go on kind of sheer. This will just be the first coat. And then once that first coat had dried, I went back with a second and then a third coat on top of that. And then here is what the finished phase looks like. After three coats, you can see it has lots of texture to it, even some lumps and bumps. And so what I'm going to do is take some fine grade P150 sandpaper and just sand it nice and smooth, getting into all the little nooks and crannies there around the neck and just trying to get as smooth a finish as I can. And then I just went back with a damp paper towel to remove off all of the remaining dust. Once I had a nice smooth finish, it was time to put on my next paint color. And I'm going to be using Waverly chalk paint that I've diluted um, down pretty much a one to one ratio paint to um, water. And then I'm using the color cashew here for this first coat. And I'm just dabbing it on with my sponge brush and then going back with a makeup brush and kind of really kind of working it in. You just want that uh, muted. Um, a coat here you don't want it to have any you see when I'm doing it with the brush it's leaving kind of severe marks so I want to go back with the makeup brush and make sure I blend those all in now you are seeing I am leaving some of the terracotta spotted in between I don't want to cover this vase with the cashew colored paint actually it's just almost a glaze now because I've watered it down so much but I don't want to completely cover it I do want to leave spots here and there of the terracotta popping through as well as apply the cashew heavier and lighter in different spots so that there is that shading going on as well. And then here you can see the kind of muddled finish that you get from doing that process. 
And now to add a little bit more dimension to the finish, I'm going to repeat the same process, this time with the Waverly chalk paint in the color hazelnut. And so I did the same thing. I diluted it pretty much a one to one water to paint ratio. And then I dabbing it on with my sponge brush and then going back with the makeup sponge to further blend and again, kind of putting it you know thinner the hazelnut thinner in some spots and a little bit leaving it a little bit darker in others and just blending all the colors together and now you can see where we now have uh, these different colors coming through and it's just really adding to the effect and giving the vase a lot of dimension we also have some naturally occurring cracks and pitting which is great because that's actually what happens as well on a real earthenware vase but we are going to want to help that along just a little bit. And so I took some red and some brown paint and I just mixed those two together because I didn't want like a stark brown. I wanted to have a little bit of that, you know, reddish tone um, that would be naturally occurring. And so I uh, just did that actually on the end of a zip tie and just kind of added those in um, to create some more pitting and some more whole uh, look of some holes in the base. And then as a finishing touch, I just want to splatter on some white paint because that is the speckling that the original does have. And so again, I just heavily diluted some white craft paint and took a, an old toothbrush and just flicked that paint onto the side of the vase. And then I'm going to go ahead and repeat the same thing with some brown craft paint. And now here you can see the finished project compared to the original. And, and looking at the two together, I think I might have gone a little overboard on the brown speckling. But other than that, I think it's looking pretty good. And the dollar dupe comes in at about $3. But if you did want to keep more to the size of the original, the increased cost of materials would bring the final cost in at about $6. For project two, I'll be doing a dollar dupe replica of the Margaret Ceramic Planter on a stand, retailing at $69. And for this one, I'm going to start with this paint and brush organizer from Dollar Tree. It comes with these four pieces. Uh, this here is the top where the paint brushes go, but I'm not gonna be using that in this DIY, but we'll probably see that in a future one. And then I'm going to just uh, put the legs in and then that's gonna form the plant stand. Next, I'm going to take this Happy Easter plastic bucket and I'm going to remove the handle. You just pop it off. And then since I want to paint this, I'm going to first go over it with some sandpaper to create a nice surface to paint on. And the first coat of paint will be a powdery coat of the white spray paint to the bucket. And then uh, for the stand, I'll be doing a powdery coat to the top of the plant stand and then a full coat on the rest of the stand. And then this is what I mean by a powdery coat. I'm just kind of lightly spraying the top, but you can see there on the back, I did do a full coat of the paint. And then I realized that I had the metallic spray paint, so I went ahead and switched that out. Just wanted to point that out there. And then here you can see, again, just a powdery coat uh, on that first layer of uh, paint on the bucket. But then I wanted to switch over to some white chalk paint. And so I did three coats of white chalk paint, brush on white chalk paint. Uh, for the bucket after that and then for the top of the plant stand i wanted a terracotta color so i just mixed in some brown craft paint with my pumpkin colored waverly chalk paint and used that to paint the top of my plant stand and then here is what the bucket looks like after it was painted with three coats of the white chalk paint but since the original has a gloss finish i'm going to go ahead and give it a couple coats of white spray paint on top of that and then by the magic of television, here is what the bucket looks like after a couple coats of the gloss on top of that. And now what I want to do is take some black chalk paint and then I just paint at the bottom as well as the inside rim of the bucket with the black chalk paint. And here you can see I'm just coating the bottom and then I'm also going ever so slightly up there around the outside edge, just kind of creating a little rim there at the bottom. Next up was to do the pattern on the front. And so I had this idea that I would use ribbon to keep the lines of the pattern straight. Since I couldn't use tape, that would tear up the paint. And if I used the ribbon, I could just tape the ends. However, that really wasn't such a great idea as the ribbon kept sliding out of place and really didn't help that much. 
Eventually, I just switch to using a ruler and just marking spaces with a pencil and just kind of did that all the way around. And I'll show you that in a little bit. But as you can see from the original, the pattern starts with first a row of dots. And so I just used a paint marker to go all the way around the bucket at the top line, creating a row of dots. Next uh, in the pattern is a row of X's. And so again, I moved down that ribbon and just created a row of X's underneath of the dots. And then after the X's came another row of dots. And then after that, it was another row of X's followed by another row of dots. Then there's about a one inch gap followed by another three rows of just dots. And then this is where I switched to the ruler. Now you can either measure from the bottom or the top to get your spacing. And since I had already done the top, I measured up from the bottom one and a half inches to start my bottom line or row, and then measured one half inch in between each row and marked that with a pencil. And this just kept going around the bucket sporadically marking for um, with a pencil line, measuring it with the ruler. And that seemed to work much better. And now here you can see the finished project next to the original. And of course the original is ceramic and metal and the dollar dupe is plastic painted to look like ceramic and metal, but I think it does give you that same look and vibe and at a much cheaper cost. For project three, I'll be doing a dollar dupe of the Jules Round Mira retailing for $199. For this project, I'm going to start with some wood clothespins from the Dollar Tree. Now I did have to break into a second pack, so you will need two packs for this project. And I'm going to be staining them with some Minwax stain in the color Special Walnut. And I'm going to stain all of the clothespins, everything included in this pack of 36. Plus I think there was an additional maybe 10 more. And then I'm going to make sure I'm getting into all the little nooks and crannies, especially where it there clips on the bottom where I'm painting right now. That's the spot that is going to be visible. Uh, the other parts really aren't going to be visible, but I am staining them just because if you're looking at the mirror from the side, you'll see the, um, the raw, you know, naked clothespin in behind. So I want to make sure that I'm staining the entire clothespin. Next, I'm going to take one of these Dollar Tree mirrors. Now, the ones that they have in store now are larger than the ones that they've had in the past, and they are held on by these kind of plastic uh, clips and um, kind of have to break the clip in order to get the mirror out, but that's okay because we're not putting it back in. Uh, but this one is a little larger than the ones that they have had in the past. And what I want to do here is just clip the clothespins onto the edge of the mirror. Now I do want to use a little E6000 glue to try to keep them in place a little bit, glue them on. And so I'm just adding a little E6000 there to the tip before clipping them onto the edge of the mirror. And then I just continued placing the clothespins around the mirror. And this is where one pack got me to. And then I had to go and stain some more and add the rest. It's probably about 12 more that I had to add there. And then once all of the clothespins were in place, I just made sure that all of the pieces were kind of in line and in place. Next, I took a three foot piece of balsa wood. You can get these at the craft stores. And with the coupons, it comes in about $2, $2.50. And so this is the 1 8 inch size. And so all I'm going to do with this is first I want to kind of distress it. So I'm going to use this melon baller to kind of just make dings or like kind of indentations and then also some scrapes. But um, you can use this or any tool. I can also just use um, a scissors. So if I take my scissors and I just take the handle and just kind of use that to dent and then also to use the blade to scrape along just any way that you can to create a little distressing into the wood. Next, I took a ruler and measured three inch lengths, and then I just drew lines across and cut there. Now the neat thing about balsa wood, if you have never used it before, is that it cuts like with the scissors. It's fantastic. So um, I just cut these little three inch squares of the balsa wood that I had just dressed. And then next I wanted to cut the wood into kind of flower petal type shapes. And so I needed them to be different sizes. And so I needed one set of the petals to be five centimeters on the top, three centimeters on the bottom, four and two, and then two and one. And so in order to do those, I took one of my squares 
and then I took the ruler and just measured across five, five centimeters and then just cut it there, uh, creating two pieces now. And that other piece I will keep, the smaller piece I will keep for my two centimeter, one centimeter petals. But for this one where I'm trying to create the five centimeter, three centimeter petal, I'm going to go ahead and take my ruler and just place it there kind of in the center of the piece on the bottom so that I can get my three centimeter length kind of centered there. And so I'll mark off the one end and then the other with the pencil. So that's that three centimeter length there in the middle. And then again, I'm going to just use some scissors to cut from that point to the upper corner on each side. And then just round it off on the top by snipping those corners on the end. And then this will create a template that I can use to trace and then just uh, cut the other squares in that shape. And then on that other side that has a remainder I can use for the smaller pieces. And then once all my pieces are cut, I'm going to dry fit them onto my mirror frame first before I glue them on. And so the pieces that are the largest pieces, those are the three centimeter pieces and the clothes pins are one centimeter wide. So you can typically get one of the larger pieces to go across three of the clothes pins the middle ones go across two of the clothespins, and then the small ones are a single clothespin. And you can kind of just shape them around using the different sizes. Uh, that creates that nice rustic look when you have these different sizes. But as you go, you're going to need to kind of trim here and there to get the pieces to fit together well. And then you can also cut pieces to fit in where there are gaps or even just when there's little splinters that kind of come from your cut pieces, you can kind of just glue those in to piece everything together. And then once you have everything dry fit, you can go back with some wood glue and just glue all your pieces to the clothespin. And don't worry about um, putting in those little pieces because, you know, don't worry about lining it up so perfectly that there might be gaps or gashes because remember the more distressed uh, the more it's going to look like the original and the more that the stain that we're going to put on top now is going to soak into those little crevices and really give you a lot of great dimension and detail. And then once all your pieces are attached it's ready for the top stain and so I'm going to just go back with that Minwax stain again in this color Special Walnut and just uh, paint all of the wood on top. I'm gonna to make sure I get all around the edges and in between in all the little crevices and then also down in uh, the where the wood and the clothespins touch the mirror. I wanna make sure that I get in along that front there so that um, the stain is covering all of the pieces of the wood. And then here's what it looks like after the stain has been applied and you can see how all those little gashes and nicks and gaps have created a lot of variation in the color and it just gives a lot of great character and dimension to the piece. And then once the stain was dry, I went back with my very most favorite polyurethane, this Rust-Oleum Triple Thick in a clear satin. The original piece does have a rather thick coat, almost like a resin coating to the top of the wood. So this triple stick, uh, thick stain is really ideal for this project. And I will be doing this one coat and then I will add a second coat on top of that. I also wanted to mention at this time that this is a smaller mirror than the original, much smaller mirror. And if you did want to get a larger mirror uh, from Michaels or Hobby Lobby, you can get those for like six or seven dollars and that will get you much closer to the size of this project of the original. Um, but you could just use the exact same technique just on a larger frame and or sorry a larger mirror and then this way you're going to get a product a result that's going to be much some more similar in size to the original mirror than this one here from the Dollar Tree mirror. And here you can see the finished project next to the original. And although it is a much smaller mirror, it still does give you that same vibe 
and you can see how using the same technique with a larger mirror will get you pretty close to the original. Plus, a larger mirror would also give you a better wood to mirror ratio. This one's a little bit, a little bit askew. But um, you can pick up a 14 inch mirror from Michaels for about $6, which will result in a fairly large 21 inch finished project and um, for a lot less for the price. And then here is one last look at the Pottery Barn inspired dollar dupes. And for the next set of DIYs, we'll be moving on to anthropology. And for the first one, I get to practice my French with Le Mieux et Compagnie Palette Pillar Candle Holder, retailing for $275. Okay, this is going to be a messy one. So, fair warning, pull those sleeves up and get those gloves on. I'm going to start with this Dollar Tree vase. Now, these come in all different colors. I did wipe it down with some vinegar, and now I'm going to just spray paint it with some of this ultra matte black spray paint. Next, I took a whole big bunch of this cotton twine from the Dollar Tree, and I'm going to place it in some of this wood stain in the color Gunstock. I just placed it there in a jar, and then just stuck the cotton twine inside and kind of squished it all around, ringed it out, and just make sure that all of the twine is being covered by the stain. Now when I opened it up there, I could see there was still some white there in the middle, so I did go back and add a little more stain again, just kind of squishing it through, making sure that I get all of the twine covered in the stain. Then once I'm sure everything's covered, I just want to take the twine back out, and now I'm kind of just removing the excess. So as I roll it back up uh, around my fingers, I'm pulling the string as I'm doing that, and that's taking off the excess stain off of the twine. And yes, I was getting stain everywhere, as you can see, so make sure that your surface is covered. But that's okay, because I'll also be using this Dollar Tree wood box with the drawer, and I just uh, want to stain that as well, so I'm just going to go ahead and lap up that stain right off the surface and stain the box. Next, I'm going to be going back to my vase that has been painted now, and I'm going to just brush on some glue. Now, I'm using this Tight Bond Quick and Thick, but you can use any craft glue like tacky glue or even regular glue. You can let it air dry a little bit so that it's a little bit thicker. And then I'm going to just start attaching my twine, and I'm going to just add that there to the bottom and just wind it around the vase, adding more glue as I go. And again, this is one messy project, but you know, it's good. It's good to get in there, make a mess, color outside the lines, you know, leave caution to the wind. Just make sure you have gloves and surfaces covered that you don't want to get all that messed up. And then you'll see how I just kind of continue to go along. And uh, as the glue pops up in between the string, I just kind of, you know, smooth it out on top of the string and then just bring it up there to the top, uh, ending it off and um, just kind of squishing it there into the glue and uh, finishing off that top piece. And then I just kind of went back because everything was kind of you know popping up in between the strings, like I said before, and just kind of smoothed it all out to make sure I had a nice and even finish. And then once it was dry, this is what it looked like. And you can see how the string mimics the carved lines of the original, but I did have a problem. The string had soaked up more of the stain and made it darker than the box. Now I could have played with some more of the stain, but I opted to just use some brown craft paint that I diluted pretty thin, uh, creating almost a stain with the brown craft paint. And then I just kind of uh, painted that over. Now you'll see where it does come up close to that uh, same color of the vase, but um, right here it's still wet, but because it is so thin, it will still dry and you still will be able to see the lines of the wood grain underneath. Now somehow I lost the footage of the next steps, but it's easy because all I did was took some black multi-surface paint and gave a fresh coat of black paint there to the top. And then I took the two pieces and glued them together with some E6000 glue. And then I just did a coat of varnish all over the entire piece. And then here you can see the two pieces, the original and the dollar dupe side by side. The dollar dupe did come out a little bit darker. We had to make that adjustment for the extra saturation of the stain, but all in all, I think it came out pretty good. 
Moving on to project two, I'm going to take a stab at the Tamara vase, retailing for $240. For the next one, I'm again going to be using one of the Dollar Tree wood boxes. Also this Life Water recycled water bottle. Smart Water brand also comes in this size bottle and shape. Next, I'm going to use some pliers to remove the point between the petals on the flower. I'll just grab the point with the pliers and snap it off. This is making the hole larger and rounder so I can place the bottle top inside. But before I do that, I'm going to want to remove the bottom of the bottle. And to do that, I'm going to use a utility knife and slowly cut along the bottom. There's a line there at the bottom and I'll just follow that line to remove the bottom of the bottle. Next, I'm going to just peel off the label and then I'm going to take some sandpaper and round off any of the sharp edges where I cut the bottom of the bottle. I'll also use some sandpaper to smooth out the hole in the box. Before putting the bottle back in, I'm just going to fill the drawer with some floral foam and place that back into the box. I'll then use my pliers to make a hole in the foam for the bottle cap. Next, I'll use some spackle to fill the spaces in the box. I'll go all around the edges and then also in the middle. I tried to get it as smooth as possible and also dipped my finger in some water to help thin the spackle out a little bit and get the smoothest finish. Once the spackle was dry, I just further smoothed out the finish with some sandpaper, just lightly going all the way around. And then I also used a Q-tip dipped in water to get into the little spaces around the cap. And now come along as I take you on my ill-fated paint journey. First, starting with this chalk spray paint in the color chiffon cream. Eh. Nope, that didn't work. Ended up leaving little specks in the finish. So I thought, okay, I'll just use this regular satin finish spray paint in ivory. Eh. This was better finish wise, but it wasn't giving me the texture that I needed. So I decided instead of continuing with the spray paint, I should just brush paint with some multi-surface paint. I did thin it out with some water because I want it to be really thin. I don't want to have any stroke marks and I am using a foam brush as well. Then I went back with the ivory satin on top again. And then here it is after the brush coat and now I will go and spray it with the spray paint. And then here it is after three light coats of the spray paint. Now you can still see some of those little specks from the original chalk paint. But um, if I were going to do this again, I would say do a powder coat of the spray paint first, just get a nice tacky uh, surface and then do the brushed coat thinned with uh, water and then back again with about three coats of the spray paint on top and I think you can get a really nice finish. And then here is a look at the two pieces together, the original there on the left at $240 and then the dollar dupe comes in at about $4. I think project three may be my favorite because look how cute this Minka textured pot is. And at $68 compared to the first two, it's a relative steal. But let's see if we can try to replicate something close a little cheaper. If you saw my vintage Christmas video, you may have seen how I abandoned this Goodwill glass canister for a taller, skinnier canister to make a vintage lantern. But I'm happy to say that today is this canister's day to shine. And its co-stars are going to be some adhesive pearl wrap from the Dollar Tree, as well as a Dollar Tree mop head and some Dollar Tree pom-poms. I'm going to also make sure this canister is nice and clean and wipe it down with some vinegar to prep the surface. Next, I'm going to cut the adhesive wrap into strips and I'm going to cut the strips four rows wide. So I'm going to count four rows of pearls and then cut and then count another four rows and then cut. And then once I have my strips cut, I'm going to just go ahead and apply them right to the side of the canister. I'm going to start the first row there, right below the lip of the canister. Just apply it there to the side. And then I'll take a second strip and start that one where the first one left off, just lining up those pearls, bringing it around to where uh, the end is, and then cut it off in that spot. Next, I'm going to take some of my tight bond glue and I do get that at Lowe's. I believe Home Depot also sells and I'll just put a strip there at the bottom of the pearls and then use that to attach one of the mop strands and I'll just pull that all the way around the outside of the canister. Then I'll adhere another strip of pearls and then just alternate that pattern 
pearls, mop strands, pearls, mop strands, all the way down the canister. And then once it's finished, it'll look something like this. And then the next step will be to paint the surface. And to paint, I'm going to use one of my favorite combinations, which is spackle and paint. And I'm gonna do this in a one-to-one -one ratio. So I'm just gonna take some of that Dollar Tree spackle, put it into a little Cool Whip container here, and then add the paint in equal measure. Uh, do you want it to be, you know, one of the thinner sides? I do, when I use this paint, I usually will use it in different combinations, but this one's gonna be a one-to-one -one ratio. And then um, it's thin enough for me to get into all those little nooks and crannies. I'm also sp paying special attention to get it inside where the uh, string is, where the mop string is, so that it is in those little crevices all the way around. And then I'll just finish up the top, painting a couple coats of the paint there all around the lip. And then once my first coat had dried, I did go back and add a second coat of the paint all over the surface. And now it's time to get messy again. So what I wanna do here is add the little pom-poms and I did go ahead and pre-mark the spaces so I don't have them you know, bumping on top of each other. When I get to the other side, I'm gonna use the little pom-poms and now I'm going to dip them right into the paint and just kind of squish them around and, and wring them out. And then I'm gonna just add a little bit of glue there to the spot that I marked and then add my messy little pom-pom. And I'm gonna go ahead and continue to do this um, all the way. I'm gonna do probably about three or four rows here and then I'll start going down from there because these are wet and they're gonna to need to dry on each side. So what I'll do is I'll create one section, let it dry, and then move on to the other sections after that. And then here you can see that first section where I applied the pom-poms all the way down. And so I'm gonna let that dry before moving on to the next sections. And then here it is about three quarters of the way done. Now I just wanted to point out that I did go ahead and add a top row there up by the lip. When I looked at the original, it did go all the way up to the top. So I don't know what I was thinking, but you see, I have a little bit more to finish there, but I'm going to continue adding that top row. And now here it is next to the original. However, the photo is a little flat, so it's not really giving you a great idea of the texture. However, you can see that in the film footage previously that the texture really did come out nice. And I have to say, that poor abandoned canister is looking pretty good. Take that, you tall skinny canister that ran off with her lid nonetheless. Because I kind of had to use it because I already was doing the DIY and I already finished that part. And anyway, she's looking good. And then for the last project, I'm going to be making some of these ceramic meditation bells. To make, I'm going to be using a couple of terracotta pots from Dollar Tree. These do come two for a dollar. And then I'm going to paint those with some chalk paint now I am going to be painting in neutral colors, unlike the original, and that's the beauty of doing things DIY. It's not always just for expense, but you can custom make them to the colors and other preferences that you like. Now the colors I chose were cashew and hazelnut from Waverly, and I will be painting each pot with two coats of paint. For the ringer, I'm going to be using the handles from my foam brushes. Now I do always keep these because they are great for DIY projects. And I'm just going to go ahead with some of the stain from the previous project and coat those up, give them a nice stained finish. For the hanger, I'm going to be using this twine rope. Now I did, I believe, buy this originally at Joann's but uh, actually the Dollar Tree thinner twine is probably closer to what's used in the original. But again, I just prefer this one. I think it's gonna look better for my taste. And so again, you get to customize things the way you would prefer when you're doing things DIY. And so what I'm going to do is cut about a three foot piece of the rope. And then I'm gonna take some of the masking tape, just cut off a little piece, and then I want to uh, tape that to both ends of my rope. Then I'm going to thread the one end through the hole in the bottom of the pot and bring that out to the other side. And then I want to tie off at about an inch and a half from the bottom. Next, I'm gonna take my foam brush handle. And I'm gonna just add a little E6000 glue there into the hole. And then I'm going to take that one end that I had threaded through the pot and stick that into the hole. And that's gonna create again the ringer and then that knot will stop it from going 
through the hole again. And then I'm going to take the rope and tie a knot there at the top of the, of the pot. Next, I'm going to start adding the beads. So what I'm going to do is create a third knot, now probably about another inch and a half above the top of the pot. And then I'll use the other end of my rope to thread my bead. So there we put the first bead in and then tie a knot there and then add a second bead on top of that and add a knot. And then to keep with the design of the original, I'm gonna go ahead and maybe put about eight, 10 inches in between those two and add a third knot, I'm sorry, a third bead there at the top, again, knotting each side. And then I just repeat the process with the other pot. And then here are the dollar dupe meditation bells next to the originals and of course they are in the neutral colors but you can easily paint them in the brighter shades if that's what you prefer and then here is one last look at the anthropology inspired dollar dupes and then for the next set of diys we'll be heading over to the silos in waco texas for some magnolia inspired dollar dupes Let's jump into this video with project one and a dollar dupe of Magnolia's ceramic and wood tiered tray, retailing at $35. I'm going to start with a Dollar Tree plunger and I'm going to just unscrew the rubber top from the pole. Next, I took a tape measure and just measured down and marked at five inches and then again at one foot. And then I proceeded to cut the pole at those marks using my saw and miter box. Once cut, I used some sandpaper to smooth out the rough edges and also to remove any remaining adhesive from the sticker. Also, I just wanna point out that you need to sand the ends smooth enough so that you can stand them up on end and they will stand up by themselves. In order to stabilize the poles for the tray, they need to have a wider base. And so I wanted to use some wood circles to uh, add those to the bottom of the poles but unfortunately my Dollar Tree only had these flowers on hand so I'm going to just make do with these and create a circle shape by tracing the bottom of a candle onto the flower and then I'll just cut it out with some scissors. Next I'm going to stain both the rounds and the poles with some wood stain in the color Gunstock. Once the first coat of stain is dry, I will go back and add a second coat. While the wood pieces are drying, I'm gonna go back to my rubber topper and I wanna cut out the piece of the plunger right where it screws onto the pole. So first I'm going to just use a utility knife to roughly cut around that area just to free up that center piece. And then once I've freed up that center piece, I'll just go back with some scissors and clean up the edges, making a nice round center piece. Then I will again take some sandpaper to smooth out the rough edges as well as sand the entire surface of the piece so that I can apply a light coat of stain to color the cut edges and bring the color of the whole piece more in line with the poles and the rounds. And then once the stain was dry, it was time to assemble the pieces and so I just took the rubber topper and screwed that right back onto the pole. And then to attach the wood rounds and the poles, I used some type bond glue, and you can use wood glue here as well, and just glued the two pieces together, and then just clean up any of the excess glue that comes out around the bottom, and then I'll just set that aside to set up. For the longer pole, I'm going to use a wood round at each end, and again, just apply it with some of the type bond glue. For the plates, I'll be using two plates from the Dollar Tree, a dinner plate and a salad plate. And then to create the edging on the sides, I'm going to be using some hazelnut colored chalk paint from Waverly. And I'll just use a makeup brush and go around the edges gently to create that pattern there along the edges. I let the glue on the risers dry overnight to make sure it had enough time for the pieces to adhere and for the glue to cure. I then went ahead and gave the risers a couple coats of polyurethane, except I didn't want to paint at the tops of the wood rounds since I will be applying glue there and don't want the polyurethane to interfere with the adhesion. 
I'm using my favorite Rust-Oleum Triple Thick Polyurethane and it comes in a nice clear satin finish. To assemble the tray, I'm again going to be using the Tight Bond Quick and Thick Glue and I just applied a nice thin even layer to the bottoms of both of the wood rounds. And then I just placed the risers in the center of the plates. The larger riser went to the larger plate and the smaller riser to the smaller plate. To make sure the riser was centered, I took a ruler and measured all the way around the plate. And since the glue was still pliable, I could shift the riser if needed. I then again let these pieces dry overnight before again attaching the two pieces together with some tight bond glue. And now here you can see the finished project with the two tiers glued together. Now the original has that flare top made out of wood and we had to use the rubber uh, topper to get that flare effect in the dollar dupe. And also the pole is not drilled through the plates so you can't carry this tray around by the pole. And the rounds were also needed to stabilize. However, the two trays are approximately the same size and the dollar dupe does give you that same modern farmhouse chic look, but at a much better price. For the next project, I'll be doing the Milo Lantern in small, retailing at $16. To start, I'm going to make some spackle paint using two parts of this steel-colored Waverly chalk paint and then one part of the spackle. I'm going to just mix those two together until they're nice and smooth. Next, I'm going to take one of the Dollar Tree magnetic containers. Now, you can get these in the office section at Dollar Tree. And this one here is the plastic one. They do have the metal one, but the glass I'm going to be using doesn't fit as well into the metal one. And um, I would suggest using this one. However, it does come in a gray color, which would have been better for this project. But I had this one on hand, and this is the one I'm using. And then as you can see, all I'm doing is painting on a nice thin coat of the paint. I'm going to let that dry and go ahead and add two more coats after that. And I will be painting both the inside and outside of the container. And then here is what it looks like after three coats of the paint have been applied and have dried. And then I'm going to just go back with some sandpaper and sand it down to a nice smooth finish. To get an even smoother finish, I just dip my fingertips into some water and then rub the sides of the container, just smoothing out all of the ridges and little lines even further. And then my container was ready for some faux finishing. And so I started with a little bit of this cinnamon colored craft paint. And I just went along the edges of the canister, both top and bottom. And then also in the middle section, just added some little dashes and dots and lines along the surface. And then once the cinnamon paint was completely dry, I took some dark gray chalk paint and using one of those chip brushes from the Dollar Tree, I just dipped the tip of the paintbrush into the dark gray paint and just began pouncing that along the sides of the container, just making little dark gray marks all the way along. Next I took some white and also some sterling silver colored chalk paint and mixed the two together. And I also added a little bit of water to that mixture as well in order to create more of like a very thin glaze type top coat. And again, just using that chip brush, I dipped the tips in and I'm just creating kind of a swirling pattern in the white or light gray paint on top. And I'm just swirling the brush around and just creating that faux finish on top. And then this hurricane style glass from the Dollar Tree fits perfectly inside and you can glue it there with some E6000 or leave it separate to make it easier to clean. And now here you can see the finished project next to the original. Now the Dollar Dupe is somewhat smaller than even the smallest version of the Magnolia Milo Lantern, but you can use the same technique with a larger vase you may already have around the house, or pick one up at a thrift store and match with a larger bottom. You can even recycle a large lid and create a larger version for not much more cost. Next up is the Reclaimed Wood Footed Tray, retailing for $56. To start, I'm going to be using one of these Dollar Tree Welcome Bunny signs. I'm going to just remove the hanger as well as the bunny tail. 
I'll be using some strips of balsa wood that I've cut down to size to cover the top of the sign. And you can get balsa wood at the craft stores for about $2 per three foot strip after coupon. To attach the wood pieces, I'm again going to use some of the tight bond glue. I'm going to just put it on top liberally and then spread it around with a foam brush to make sure that I'm getting a nice even coat of the glue and that the pieces will stick properly. And I'll just apply the wood pieces and finally weight them down with some books to make sure it dries evenly. For the feet, I'll be using some Dollar Tree Jenga blocks and I'll glue two of them together lengthwise to create a pair. Then glue that pair to another pair to create a four piece Jenga block. And then I will repeat that process to create the other three feet. For the sides of the tray, I'm going to be using some painter sticks that I picked up at Walmart. They come in a package, three for a dollar. But before I do any cutting on those, I do want to distress the wood a little bit. I'm going to start with the tray top. And since that's covered with the balsa wood, I am able to easily distress that with a screwdriver. I just went ahead and made some little holes and lines in the wood. However, the painter sticks are made out of a heavier pine wood and not as easy to distress. So I went ahead and took them outside to the sidewalk and just began scraping the wood sticks along the sidewalk and the little pebbles and uh, stones in the cement did create a nice distressing, some nice scrapes for my wood. And then my wood was ready to stain and I used Minwax wood stain in the color Special Walnut. To make the tray sides, I took the paint sticks and just measured right on the tray, taking the stick end to end and then just marking with a pencil where it needed to be cut. And then I did this for both sides. I cut the sticks with my miter box and saw, but um, it, unfortunately I was not able to get two sides into one stick. And you can see there where it kind of the second stick would have gone into that dippy part, which would be fine too. It wasn't, you know, because this is that distressed look, uh, reclaimed wood look. But I did go ahead and use a spare piece that I had or a, um, a scrap piece that I had from another project to get the uh, proper size of the side. And then I attached the sides using some type bond glue as well as some hot glue for that immediate hold. And then once the glue on the short sides was dry, I went back with another paint stick and measured across for the long side. And now I am making sure that the ends of the short sides are covered when I mark. And then the two long sides were also glued in place. And then once the glue was dry on those, I flipped it over and attached the little feet again using the type bond glue. And then when those were dry, I gave the whole piece another coat of stain and then finished up with a couple coats of polyurethane. And then here you can see the finished piece next to the original. And although the dollar dupe is four inches shorter and two inches less wide than the original, it's still pretty sizable at 13 and a half by nine and a half inches and has a very similar look to the original with considerable savings. For the last project, I wanted to do another basket. And I know that Magnolia does some beautiful baskets for Target's Hearth and Hand Collection by Magnolia. And I found these beautiful Hudson baskets that range in price and are about $30 each. For this dupe, I'm actually going to be using some Dollar Tree baskets. Now, these are pretty flimsy, but a quick hack to create a more durable and sturdy basket would be to just put two of the Dollar Tree baskets together. And so you have to be careful though, when you're in the store, you need to find two that fit well together. Now these two actually do fit well, but it's the reverse. I have to put one inside the other versus vice versa. So you see that those same two baskets fit very well, just flipping them around. So just find two baskets that fit well together and you'll see how it creates quite a nice and sturdy basket. Now to further take these baskets up a few notches, all I'm going to do is stain the inside and outside of the baskets with some wood stain. 
I'll be using Minwax in the color Dark Walnut, even though that's really not the color of the original piece. It's just the color that I want to use because it'll match something better in the room I want to pl place it in. And so that is the beauty as well of doing things DIY. You get to choose the shading that you prefer. And you can see how quickly and easily the stain goes onto the basket. And it's amazing what a rich and luxurious effect it gives. And even though I am placing these one basket inside the other, I am coating both the inside and outside of each basket. To join the two baskets together, as well as give a more unified look, I'm going to be adding a strip of this nautical rope that I got from Dollar Tree. I'm going to just hot glue it right into the crease and glue the rope to both the top and bottom baskets. Again, holding them together, as well as creating a decorative touch. To create the handles, I cut a six inch piece of the rope, and then for the little brackets on the end, I used the headband from a Happy Birthday Tiara. Now there are two wires that run along the length of the headband. And so what I did was I cut just to the inside of those wires on each side, and that still gave me a pretty nice band of headband in between to use. To tone down the shininess a bit, I took some dark gray craft paint, just added a little water to thin it out a bit, and then I just took a piece of paper towel and just pounced it along the silver, and that just gave it more of a distressed, aged look. And then I just took some hot glue, put that at the end of the rope, and attached the metal there at the bottom, then wound the strip around twice before bringing it back to the back again and adding a little more hot glue attaching it, and then cutting off the end. When attaching the handle to the basket, I made sure to find the spot where the uh, rope that goes around the rim started and stopped so that I could cover it there with the handle and the bracket. And then I just glued the other side of the handle with some hot glue, and then again, uh, the other side of the handle, or the, on the handle on the other side of the basket, um, just directly across from the first handle. And then you can see how cute it is once it all comes together. Now, of course, it's not an exact dupe because it does have the rope around the rim as well as the darker color, but it does look pretty close to the original. There is one critical flaw, however. It's not a Magnolia dupe. Oh my goodness. This is something I did not realize until I went back to the Target page to get the dimension info. And I'm looking at it going, wait a second, why did this come up? It comes up with the Magnolia search, but it is in fact not. But they are made by a manufacturer named Tag, but I think it comes up with the Magnolia search because I think Tag was inspired by Magnolia. So there we go, still Magnolia inspired. And now here is one last look at the Magnolia inspired dollar dupes. And for the next set of DIYs, we'll be moving on to H&M Home. Let's jump into the first project of this video, H&M's Mira with Rattan Frame, retailing for $34.99. For this project, I'm going to be using some of the Dollar Tree glow sticks. I'm going to be using both bracelets and necklaces, so I need one pack of each. I'll use three from each of the packets. And then I went ahead and just bent them around as if I was using them for glow sticks. And of course they will light up. You can't really see it here. Uh, but of course, as you know, that glow goes away probably in an hour or two. Uh, and then what I wanna do is take those three bracelets and use the connectors to connect the three together in a circle. Next, I took two of the necklaces, bent those around and formed those into a larger circle. And then with that third necklace, I just connected it to itself to create one smaller circle. Then I took some masking tape and just reinforced around the connectors. And then to give my 
glow stick hoops, a bit of a rattan finish. I went ahead with a hula skirt from the Dollar Tree and cut off the strands. And then I'm going to just wrap the the hoops with the hula skirt. I want to keep saying hula hoop, but I want to wrap the glow stick hoops with the hula skirt strands. There we go. And um, then I'm just using some of my tight bond glue to adhere it. Um, you can use any glue here. I'm just using that one because I will need it in other parts of this project. So I just figured I'd use that one. And then this is what they look like after I did wrap these three times. That is a little bit labor intensive, but I wanted to give it a nice finish. And then I just took some of this territorial beige craft paint and added a little water to it to create a stain for the hoops. And I'm going to be staining the largest hoop and the second to largest hoop. I'm not going to be staining that small hoop. I did put that one aside. And then once the stain was dry, I took the larger hoop and set that aside. And then with the smaller hoop, what I want to do is attach some more of the hula strands to this smaller hoop. And so what I did was I cut six inch strands of the hula skirt, and then I'm just folding it in half. And then what I did was add some dabs of glue there to the hoop. And I'm kind of just spacing the dabs of glue approximately one width of the um, hula skirt strand. So I'm just kind of eyeballing it. You can measure it if you want a more exact finish. And then once all the strands were attached, I took the smallest hoop, the one that I didn't stain, the one that was the one necklace joined together, and I placed that inside of the hoop with the strands glued to it. And so uh, it fits really nicely right inside. And then when you flip it over, you can see that the strands actually come out now between the two hoops. And that's the way you want it for the next step. For the mirror, I'm going to be using this mirror from the Dollar Tree. Now I did want to point out that this is the newer mirror that they now carry in the stores and it is a little bit larger than the ones that they've had in the past. So just want to point that out. And then to glue the hoops to the mirror, I am going to be placing that part where I glued the strands to the hoop down so that that's the part that touches the mirror. And then I'm using tight bond glue here, but you could also use E6000. What I like about the tight bond is that it does have a pretty good setup within 15 seconds. And so um, what I'm doing here is just kind of maneuvering it and, and positioning it to make sure that while it is in that setup phase, that it is kind of keeping the shape properly. And then once that piece was set, I took the larger hoop and placed it so that it was about three inches away from the center piece all the way around. Next, I took the strands and where each strand was, I added again a dab of glue there to the top on the outer hoop. And you can see where I already did have some dabs of glue and had applied these sticks. These are the craft sticks that you get from the Dollar Tree. And I did get two packs of these. And then what um, I did was I did it backwards. And so I had to pull all of the little sticks off. And so that's why you see those little kind of marks there where I had to pull the glue off. You also see on the sticks themselves, they have uh, some of the paint where it got pulled off of the hoop. So anyway, um, I'm just gluing the two pieces together with the sticks. And I kind of did it where I tried to do it on the hoop and then I did it on the stick. And Either way, it's kind of, um, you know, six of one, half a dozen of the other, whichever way you want to do it. But just uh, glue the two pieces together with the sticks. And then I just wanted to point out that as I was doing this, I was measuring to make sure that there was that three inch difference between the hoops. And then at that point, I did leave the whole piece in place overnight to make sure that I could get a nice strong bond so I could pick it up and do this with it, since I would have to handle it quite a bit in the next steps. And so next what I did was I took the strands that were at the bottom of each one of the sticks and wrapped it around and glued it there on the back to create that kind of crisscross rattan weave. And so what I'm doing with the hula skirt is wrapping it around, twisting it around so that it kind of creates a smaller or thinner strand. And then I'm going to just add a little bit of my glue and then again, just crisscross the two pieces. I do kind of want to wrap it around the bottom of the pole so that the pole is sticking out a little bit. 
and then that can just get wrapped around to the back and glued to the back of the mirror. Also, I did remove the hanger from the original mirror. It just is uh, on with a little screw, so I just unscrewed that screw. And then I'm going to attach it to the back of this mirror with some E6000 glue. And then to create that rattan weave again around the top hoop, I just took another strand of the hula skirt, twisted it around to create that thinner strand, and then crisscrossed it across the two pieces, the stick and the hoop and just glued it there to the back. And then here you can see once the rattan weave has been applied to the outer loop. I also wanted to point out that the original does have a rattan hanger that can be made by joining two of the bracelets together and then wrapping it. I didn't want to use that one. I think it looks better without it. So I'm just going to go ahead and use the Dollar Tree hanger. And now here you can see the finished project next to the original. And as you can see, the dollar dupe is actually larger than the original. That's not typical. Usually we come in smaller, but um, it, this does come out larger by about a good four inches. So that's pretty good. And at quite the savings for just about $7. Up next is H&M's Large Bamboo Plant Pot, retailing for $24.99. For this project, I'm going to use this waste paper basket from the Dollar Tree as well as a roll of Dollar Tree masking tape. And so what I did was took the masking tape and cut it down to strips of about 15 inches. Then I'm going to apply the masking tape to the waste basket. And it, um, the first one's like the hardest one to do, but um, just kind of pull up the strip because you, you do want to try to get it without those little creases in it. Some creases aren't in that big a deal since you'll see it kind of gets covered anyway. But um, if you can get it without the creases, that's even better. So um, what I'm going to do for the next strip though is I'm going to overlap the first one by a little bit. And this is what's going to create those kind of neutral strips that go in between the uh, kind of colored strips on the planter. And um, again, just kind of pulling it and making sure that you can get it as smooth as possible. And then I'm going to just continue this process all the way down to the bottom of the planter. And on that last piece of tape, I'm gonna let that overlap a little bit and then cut some, um, some little snips and then just fold the tape over onto the bottom of the container. And then I'll just do the same thing at the top, just cutting those little snips and kind of folding it over into the top of the container. Then I'll take that bottom piece of tape and kind of tuck it there underneath of the rim. Next, I took some craft paint in the color Toasted Marshmallow, and I did dilute that with a little bit of water. And you can use any paint that's a color that's similar to a bamboo or a, a wicker shade. And I'm just lightly coating that. I just want to create a nice base for the faux finish that I'll be doing next. To help create the strips, I'm going to be using some washi tape. So I have two here, one that I got from Michael's, the, th the thicker one, and then this really thin one that they sell at Dollar Tree. And then once that base coat was dry, I went ahead and added my washi tape and I just added the thinner pieces where I had thinner overlapping and the thicker pieces where I had thicker overlapping. And then in order to create that faux bamboo strip look, I'm going to use this craft paint in the color Warm Buff. I'm also going to be using a piece of thread to run that thread through the paint and then use the thread as kind of like a stamper to create those thin little lines in the strips. And this is the first of two paints that I'll be using. And I'll just continue to go through kind of stamping with the thread in between the lines of washi tape. 
And then the next color I'll be using is Territorial Beige. And I'll just repeat the process with this color. Again, just using the thread as a stamper and running the thread through the paint and just applying thin little strips of that color in between the washi tape to create that bamboo effect. And then once the paint is dry, I'll go ahead and remove the washi tape. And now you can reuse these strips to complete the faux finishing on the other side of the planter. Lastly, I'm just going to do a finished coat of Mod Podge to the top of the planter. And now here you can see the finished project next to the original. Now, I think this one does need some tweaking, both in terms of color as well as um, the thickness of the rings. But otherwise, I think it is a pretty good technique to get something very similar to the original and at a huge savings. For the next project, I'll be trying my hand at H&M's Tasseled Rectangular Cushion, retailing for $49.99. For this project, I'm going to be using two of the Dollar Tree bath mats. And shout out to Megan at Glue Guns and Roses, who I believe was the first YouTube crafter to bring us the Dollar Tree rug pillow. But in this version, what I'm going to be doing is cutting out that middle piece on both of the rugs. So I'm going to just start there and use that middle section as a guide and just take my scissors and cut right up along the side of that middle piece all the way through to the other end. And I'll do that on the other side as well. I'll do that for both rugs and then I'll set that middle piece aside. Next, I'll take both ends on both rugs and flip them back to the shaggy side and then apply some hot glue there to the middle. This is going to be the inside of the pillow and this is what the outside of the pillow will look like when we get there. But first I want to go back and go ahead and do the shaggy parts of the rug. I'm going to do that on both the top and the bottom and for both of the rugs. Next I went back to the center pieces. Uh, that I had put aside previously. And I'm just going to cut out this middle rectangle. And this is also though where I wish I had a DeLorean and a flux capacitor so I could build a time machine and go back in time so that I could cut this width down by about an inch and a half. We'll see that in a minute. But what I'm doing here is actually removing some of the underneath of the rug where the two pieces butt together. And that's just giving me a nice um, smoother joint there between the two pieces. Then I went and took the other little pieces that were on the ends and cut those down as well. That gave me four pieces on the ends. And I'm going to just use those for the backs of the pillows. So um, from those center pieces, I got those four little pieces and the two wider pieces up top. Next, I'm going to join the two pillows together again using hot glue and this stuff. I don't know what the fiber is that makes up these, these Dollar Tree rugs, but hot glue literally fuses these two things together unbelievably. So you cannot separate the two after hot glue has been applied to these fibers. So I know this to be a fact, as a matter of fact, which we'll find out shortly. But in any event, right now, all I'm doing is just uh, hot gluing the ends together. And they do have a nice finished edge. So that's giving me a great, easy way to just create uh, a nice finished edge on the pillow. I will leave that one side open and uh, so I can stuff it later on. But before I go ahead and do that, I am going to apply my way too wide middle pieces to the pillow and again with some hot glue which i wish i didn't do now because i didn't realize it was too wide until later but in any event i went ahead and um, applied this middle piece and did the hot glue there to the middle along the edges all the way around
And then once those shaggy bits were attached, it was time to stuff. And what I'm using here is actually from an old comforter. I've made about, I made all of my daughter's dorm pillows, which was about seven or eight from that comforter and I still have leftover and so that's what I'm using here to stuff this pillow so definitely don't throw out any old comforters or pillows you can always use them for projects like this in the future and then simple and easy little um, hot glue there on the end to close it up next it was time to make the tassels and the tassels on the original are really thick I think that's one of the neat features about it. It has a really thick band there at the top as well. And so to make the tassels, I'm going to use some of this yarn from the Dollar Tree. This is in the color Crepe, which matches the rug really well. And what I wanna do is cut one small little piece, and that is a three inch piece of cardboard that I've cut there out of a box. And then that piece just goes there along the top uh, horizontally and then I will wrap the ribbon I'm sorry not the ribbon the yarn around the cardboard vertically and I because this is quite a thick tassel I will wrap this yarn 100 times And then once I have my 100 wraps, I'm going to just take that horizontal piece of yarn that I had uh, put on there first and just tie that off at the top to hold the tassel together. And then once I have a nice knot there at the top, I'll just go ahead with some scissors and cut the bottom of the yarn to remove it from the cardboard. To make that thick band at the top, I'm going to take another piece of yarn and just wrap that around about 10 times before tying it off just to create that nice thicker kind of band there at the top of the tassel. To attach the tassel to the pillow, I'm going to sew it on using that big honkin' needle. You know that one that's in your needle box and you're saying, what will I use that for? Something like this. Something like this would be a good choice. So I'm just going to sew it on and I'm just going through the material and then through the top of the tassel. Back and forth. I did it maybe about 15 times. And then I'll just take it around the back and do some lock stitches to just hold that in place. Just um, bring the needle through the back and then the needle through the thread as well. And then I just went back and cut off that excess yarn at the top of the tassel, which originally held it together. And here you can also see the back of the pillow and how nice that looks with more texture, less shag. This is about the time that I realized that that piece was too wide. And here you can see what I mean next to the original. That middle piece should have been about an inch and a half to two inches less wide. And I'm sitting there all week because this was the first project I did and it's making me crazy. And I'm like, okay, should I jack with the pillow and you know, risk messing it up? Or should I just leave well enough alone? But of course, since I'm crazy obsessed, I did. And then here you can see take two of this project where I did try to lessen the width of that center piece. Not very well. It was a hot mess. I had to cut the glue out. I couldn't get the strip straight. Yes, not advisable. However, I do think it looks much better. I would just suggest to do it right the first time. For the last project, I'll be making these adorable boy and girl ceramic vases, retailing for $29.99 each. To make the girl vase, I'm going to be using these acrylic bowls from the party section of the Dollar Tree, and I'm going to just use some E6000 glue to glue the two pieces together. For the boy vase, I'm going to be using the small cylinder vase from Dollar Tree, and I'm also going to be using this Icebreakers Duo uh, Mint box 
for the base. Now, what I really like about this mint box is that you it, it opens, right? So you can glue the other part to the bottom of the vase and then use that for a secret hiding place. So I thought that was pretty cool. Now, if you don't have that type of uh, container, you can use anything. The lid even to the spackle container would also make a great base. Next, I'm going to be painting the vases with a spackle paint mixture made of one part of chalk paint in the color plaster and one part of spackle, Dollar Tree spackle, and then I'll mix the two together and add a little water to make it nice and spreadable. And then I will paint both of the vases and the bases with this paint mixture and I'll just do one coat. To make the face features, I'm going to use this air dry clay that I picked up at Dollar Tree in the craft section. I'm just going to be using a small amount. I'm going to roll it out into a kind of, I guess, log shape and then just um, shape it around to create the lips. And I'll just place that in place on the little girl first ladies first and then um, again another little log shape to create the bottom lip. You just kind of pinch those into place on the surface. And then I'll create another longer log. And now this one is going to create the um, eyebrow and nose features. And I'll just take a little teeny piece there to create the nose there at the bottom. Next, I took another small piece, rolled it out and created that eyelid and then another piece that was joined together to create a circle and that's going to form the eye. And then I'll go ahead and form the same features on my boy vase and then when that's complete I'll set them both aside for the clay to dry. Once the clay is dry, I am going to move the pieces out of the way because they're not going to stick the way they are. So I need to glue those on. So I'm just using some E6000 glue. And what's nice is that it did leave a little outline where the features were. So I'm able to just put the glue in that space and then slide the features back into place so that they can be glued. And even if they break apart, it's fine. You can just, um, of course it's gonna be glued. So you can just glue it the pieces back together. And then once the glue is dry, I'll go back with my spackle paint. And you do want to make sure that it is nice and thin so it can get in between all those little cracks and crevices of the features. And I'm going to go ahead with two more coats of the spackle paint. And so this is what it looks like after two more coats of the spackle paint. But it does need still a little more paint and I decided I did want to switch over to spray paint to give it a finer finish. And I did start out with that satin ivory but then I remembered this chalked paint spray paint gives a really nice finish very similar to the original so I switched over to that one. And now here you can see the finished project next to the original and while the dollar dupe is not as refined as the original it is still a really fun project to do and don't forget if you use the mint container as the base for the boy vase you do get a bonus secret hiding place and in case you're wondering i did in fact zip tie the ends of my fake succulent as well as tape down the little wispy curl on the front of the girl vase to make it look more like the original because as i previously mentioned i kind of get crazy obsessed and then here's one last look at the H&M Home inspired dollar dupes. And for the next set of DIYs, we'll be moving on to West Elm. Let's jump into this video with project one and a dollar dupe of West Elm's Shelfmate square wood and metal shelf retailing at $60. 
I'm going to start with some of these Dollar Tree bamboo cutting boards. I'll actually be using two of those. And then also this wall hanging that has a square frame. I'm just going to be using the frame. And all I want to do is uh, pull out the little back clips because I'm not going to need those. But you want to be real careful when you're doing this. Just kind of wiggle them back and forth. These uh, frames are rather fragile. And if you yank too hard, it might break the frame. I'll also be using these L-shaped two and a half inch brackets. Now I did buy the four pack because I'm going to be using uh, those on the next project as well. And what I want to do is spray both the frame and the brackets with some black metallic spray paint. Next I went back to my cutting boards and like I mentioned I did take a second cutting board because I do want to make a thicker shelf. And so all I'm going to do is take the two bamboo cutting boards and some of my favorite uh, tight bond glue in the thick and rich formula. It's a multi-purpose glue. I do get that at Lowe's and I'm going to just uh, place that liberally on the one side of the one bamboo tray and then place the two together and then I'll just wipe off any glue that comes out of the seam. To make sure I get a nice and tight fit, I'm going to also just use some of these Dollar Tree clamps. Dollar Tree sells these now in the craft section, so for a buck, you can't beat that. And then I'm just going to put those together. It's going to push out some more of the glue, so I just want to clean that up a little bit before I set it aside to just make sure that the glue sets and dries. And then after about an hour or so, the glue was set, and I went ahead and took the brackets off. And now I want to just take it to what I'm going to have is the back side, and I'm going to... I'm not going to want to add the brackets right now. I just want to make the holes because once I put the frame on, it's going to get a little bit tricky. So uh, to get in there with um, a, a drill or a driver. And so what I did was I just decided to go ahead and put the screws in now. But then I just took them right back out again because I don't want to actually put the brackets on right now because I'll need to have them off in order to put the frame on but uh, at least I'll have the holes drilled and it'll be prepped and ready to go. Next I flipped the board back over and then I just measured up from the edge two and a half inches and drew a line across. Then I took some of my thick and quick glue again and just added some dabs there at the mark where I had drawn the line but on the side of the board. And then that's going to be where my frame attaches but in order to get a good sizing on the bottom, I took a two inch book and just going to lay the longer side of the cutting board on that book while I kind of scoot the frame in uh, along the sides. And then by sitting the um, bamboo cutting board on the book, it's going to allow me to have a good sizing for the bottom portion as well. So if I put the frame down on the surface and the bamboo cutting board on the book, that'll keep me a good two inch distance from the bottom and allow the glue to set up uh, in that position. And then I just went back with a Q-tip to clean up any excess glue that might be coming out there around the sides. And then to ensure that my frame was staying in an upright and straight position, I just took a shorter book and slid it on the other side underneath of the cutting board. Once the type bond glue was set, I took some hot glue and reinforced the back of the frame where it met the shelf. Next, I attached the brackets to the bottom of the shelf and you can see how it works out much better now uh, with that uh, frame in the way that it's easier to just go ahead and add the screws and not have to kind of maneuver that drill around and just can kind of, kind of hand screw them in there since the holes were already made. Now like with any shelf you always want to make sure that you use the proper hardware before attaching it to the wall and so that would include either self anchoring screws or an anchor and screw or if you can at least put one end into a stud that will also work. And in the video where I made this shelf pictured here, I also offer a quick hack on finding wall studs as well as other shelf hanging instructions. So if you want to check that video out, I will link it here and in the description. And now here you can see the original and the dollar dupe hanging side by side. They are very similar looking, although they are uh, somewhat different in size. You can see the side differentials there, but they're also somewhat different in price as well. And then for the next dollar dupe, I will again be doing another shelf, this time a reclaimed wood floating shelf, retailing for $80. 
For this next shelf, I'm going to be using one of these cat scratch boards from Dollar Tree. Now, this is a little bit flexible, but I will be covering it with some balsa wood and that will make it nice and solid. Now, if you're not familiar with balsa wood panels, you can pick them up at pretty much any craft store. And the ones I'm using here are three inches wide, three feet long, and one eighth of an inch thick. And with a coupon, you can usually get them for about $2 a panel. But before I cover my cat scratch board with the balsa wood panels, I do want to distress them a little bit. And so I got some tools here. I have a, a pliers and a Phillips screwdriver and a flathead screwdriver, as well as even a melon baller, uh, because what I'm trying to do is recreate the look of reclaimed wood. So quite often you'll have scrapes in the wood. There'll be different demarcations. Um, you'll often have nail holes and things of that nature. So, um, you know, just want to show how it's been weathered uh, over time and just used for other purposes. Like, you know, it was already nailed together, so there'll be nail holes. So uh, again, just going through and I'm going to do the surface of both of the boards. I'm going to go through and just kind of put holes and scrapes and uh, different demarcations throughout the surface of both boards. For the stain, I'll be using Minwax in the color Special Walnut. I like this color for reclaimed wood type projects because it tends to go on lighter on the surface and then gives a nice dark shading in those little nooks and crannies. But since the piece I'm trying to replicate does have some further color variations, I did go ahead and also use this Varathane stain in the color Gunstock. But as you'll see, the difference is very subtle, so I think you're good to go with just the Special Walnut stain. And now here you'll see what I mean by the special walnut. I'm doing that one first. And as I paint it on, I'm just painting on a light uh, coat of the stain. And as I do so, the um, little nooks and crannies you'll see are kind of absorbing more of the stain color while the surface, it's just coming on lighter. And as it dries, that'll, that effect will even increase. So you'll see the darker portions in the little demarcations and on the surface, it'll come up nice and light. And then here's where I was going to show you the other color, the gun stock. So I've already painted it on here, uh, but I'll show you how I did that. My camera's been misbehaving, so I will do that on this panel. Okay, so here you can see where it's already been stained with the special walnut. And now I'm going to just go in on those other sections that I left kind of blank and work in some of this gun stock. And again, like I mentioned, it is very subtle. Now I'll go back to the special walnut and you'll see that there really is barely any difference in the two. So you're probably good to go with just the one color and I would definitely go with the special walnut. To cover my cat scratch panel, I'm going to use one of my balsa wood panels. I'm going to just lay it there on top of the cat scratch board and then just use the board itself to indicate where I have to cut. And then if you've never used balsa wood before, you'll be surprised to know that it's so wonderful you can cut it with scissors. And so I kind of cut maybe three quarters of the way through and I just flipped it around because I just didn't want to crack the wood. So um, just cut it on the other side with the scissors. You could also use a utility knife to cut this wood. Next, I took my cut panel and I applied a nice healthy portion of this Type Bond Quick and Thick glue to the back side. And then I'm just going to go ahead and glue it right to the surface of my cat scratch board. To cover the small piece still remaining on the top, I'm going to go ahead and grab board number two. I put the cut piece of board number one to the side and I'm going to now use board number two to uh, finish off just that skinny piece that is still left over. So all I did was just align the two pieces up, flip it over. I'm again going to use the cat scratch board as my guide and I'm going to just mark there where I need to cut. Now the thing about this though is that I'm not going to cut it off there at the length of the cat scratch board. I'm going to take this line all the way down the three foot of the board and cut there. I'm going to cut that off camera and I'll be back. And now here you can see how I cut the second board all the way down the full length of the board. Just having the skinny piece that's going to fill in the back portion of the shelves, both top and bottom. But I will now just kind of lay that in. I'm going to put that on the side that has the machine cut so I don't have any gapping. So it's machine cut to machine cut. 
and then I'll cut it off there at the bottom for the length. And then once that piece is glued on, I'll flip it over and repeat the process on the back side using the remaining piece of board one and also the remaining skinny piece of board two. And then I'll just set it aside for the glue to set and I'm going to also add some books to the top to weight it down, make sure everything stays in place and the seams don't curl. Once the glue was set on the main piece, it was time to do the sides of the shelf. And so I'm going to be using that wider piece from board two, and I'm going to just use the shelf itself to measure where I need to cut the side. Then I'll attach the side pieces, again using the tight bond glue. Now I should have actually added some hot glue there because I actually had to stand there and hold it, but uh, some hot glue would have helped to keep it in place while the other glue set up. And then for the front piece, I'm again going to use that remaining piece of board number two, and I'm going to just lay it straight across the front, making sure to go flush with the side pieces so that they are actually covered, the ends of those are covered. And I'll again use the quick and thick glue to attach the front piece, but I'm also gonna add some hot glue in between for that quick hold. To add the brackets, I'm gonna use both E6000 glue and the screws. So uh, what I did was I put some E6000 there at the bottom of the bracket. Then I'm going to take a screw and add some tight bond glue to both the screw hole and the screw, th screw threads, and then just go ahead and screw the screw into the bracket. And then attach the brackets to both sides, and then I would let this sit at least 48 hours before hanging. Also, I just wanted to point out that because of the longer sides, it does create somewhat of a false bottom so that the brackets kind of tuck up underneath and it does have the appearance for the most part of being a floating shelf. And then a couple coats of polyurethane will complete the look. And now here is the finished project next to the original. And of course the original is solid wood and it is about a third larger in length and double the width but the dollar dupe is still pretty sizable at 16 inches long and four inches wide. Now, I won't go putting any textbooks or heavy potted plants on it, but it certainly can handle things like photos, canvases, or small vases like the ones shown here. Next up is this adorable pom-pom storage basket retailing for $49. I'm going to start with this straw hat from the Dollar Tree. Now, this is a technique I saw from Kareem at DIY Kareem. She used to be uh, in the event with Kareem and she has some beautiful, beautiful items that she makes as well as some great techniques. And one of them is to use these straw hats to create basket-like um, creations, different little holders and different types of things. And so all you need to do is kind of start it there with some scissors, cut that original piece and then it kind of just pulls off by itself. Now I did have one hat that I did have to continue to kind of clip along. So if you have that hat, don't think there's something wrong with you. It, it's, I don't know, it's just one, this one came apart super easy and then the other one I had to kind of clip along the whole way. But I did use two hats for this project and hopefully if you do this project, you get the easy come apart ones. So it's not that much of a hassle. And then once I had my hat taken apart, I did want to stain it. So I just rolled it up to kind of keep it in place. And I'm going to be staining with this golden pecan color. Now, um, in my previous DIY on anthropology, I used another shade called gunstock. I just happen to have a whole bunch of stains. But if you happen to do that one and you're like, oh my goodness, another, no. Gunstock will work just as well with this. This one's just a little bit more yellow than the gunstock, but that will work as well if you happen to have that one on hand and you'll get a very similar color to this one here. And so I just continued to, um, as, I, as I stained it, I also rolled it up because it was just kind of getting out of hand. So I just wanted to point that out as well. And then when it was all stained, I just set it aside to dry. Next, I'm going to take one of the Dollar Tree mesh waste paper baskets, and I want to wrap these hat strands. That's what I'm going to call it, a hat strand. I don't know what I was going to call it, but you know what I'm talking about. Wrap the hat strand around, and I'm going to do single layers. So I just measured the hat strand around, and now I'm going to apply that first layer with some E6000. So the very bottom will have E6000, but that's all. And then I just put the E6000 there all along the mesh at the bottom and then attach that first 
hat strand row there with the E6000. And then I just want to set that aside and let that fully dry before I start with my next rounds, which again, I will just measure uh, a single strand around, cut there, and then add this second strand now with hot glue. And I just am gluing there at the very top and overlaying just the very bottom of the second strand. And then here it is half the way up. Now I just wanted to point out that I did use a piece of the hat strand where it does bend where the brim meets the rest of the hat. That's probably not advisable. You should probably just skip that section of the hair strand because it does bend up and it gives a little bulgy look. And then here you can see after all of the hat strands have been attached and I did just do everything in one starting and stopping spot. So there's just that one seam down the back and I didn't cover the bottom because I didn't want it tore up and you can't see it anyway. Um, but this way I figured it would stay nicer and not get ripped up on the bottom. And you can see how nice it looks. I think it looks great just like this without the pom-poms. Uh, and it's such a nice size basket as well because it is one of those waste paper size baskets so you can fit a lot in there and I like how you can also has that kind of um, wicker look coming out the back although I think the black basket might have been the better option here. Now to make the pom-poms Dollar Tree did have some of this caramel colored yarn and I thought it made a pretty good match and would have made some really cute pom-poms. Also maybe some twine would be a good option. However, when I was in Dollar Tree, I found these. Oh my goodness, how cute are these? They remind me of those Tribbles from the Trouble with Tribbles episode of Star Trek. Oh my gosh, I love that episode, it's so funny. Anyway, I just thought they were so cute and I, they're actually hair elastic pom-poms. So I found them in the hair section at Dollar Tree and they do come two to a pack. And uh, all I did was cut off the hair elastic part and I uh, just put them right there, plop them right on. Now these do bring the cost of it up a little bit. It would be much cheaper to just use the yarn, but I just love them so much I had to get them. Now, I think these look super cute, but they are a little large for the basket. So I did want to cut them down a bit. So I decided to give them a little haircut and I'm just cutting all around. Now, of course, this would have been much easier had I done this before gluing them to the side of the basket but I'll do that for the other side and if you do it I would suggest you do this as well but you can see how much cuter they look trimmed down a little bit and better um, sized to the basket and then here is the finished project along with the original and you can see that it is pretty comparable in size that's pretty nice now with those hair elastic pom-poms it is a little bit more expensive at about eight dollars but if you did the yarn pom-poms this project will come in at about five for the last West Elm dollar dupe, I'll be doing the Bishop Pedestal Planter, retailing at $130. For this one, I'll be using this bucket from the Dollar Tree, this little Easter basket bucket, and the handle just pops right off. Now this is very similar to the one that we did for Anthropology last video, but this time I want to remove these little uh, edges here. They bugged me the last time that I left those on, so I'm gonna try to give it a try this time. And I'm doing it with um, a utility knife. It, it's really not the best process. I kind of just cut down uh, from the top there and that kind of separated the little bucket attachment from the side of the bucket. And then I went back with some wire cutters and also tried to get up underneath and clip there. It really wasn't the greatest process, but I was able to get it off fairly well. To finish it off a bit, I just took some sandpaper and sanded down those rough edges. Then I used the sandpaper to also lightly sand the surface of the bucket so that I could prepare it for painting. From here, I'm just going to take my bucket and this white bowl I also got from Dollar Tree and give them a light powder coat with this white spray paint. And then this is what I mean by a powder coat, it's just a light coating. Uh, you can see it here over the image, just a light coating of the spray paint. And then I'm going to do three coats of this white chalk paint. And then once those coats were on and dry, I just attached the two pieces together with some E6000 glue. 
And then once that glue is dry, I'll take the entire piece outside for several coats of this gloss white spray paint. And then here's the finished project next to the original, a quick and easy dollar dupe to get that beautiful high-end West Elm look for just about $4. And then here's one last look at the West Elm inspired Dollar Dupe DIYs. And for the next set of projects, we're going to be mixing it up a little and actually doing several projects that are large in scale. And they are from actually three different stores, Pottery Barn, West Elm, and Restoration Heart. For the first project, I'll be making a framed textile art piece. Now these are quite popular and are available at Pottery Barn, Restoration Hardware, West Elm, as well as many other of the high-end retailers. For the Fab Tax version, I'll be using this table runner that I picked up at Marshall's for $5, as well as this Goodwill frame that I picked up for $14.99. It's a little more than I typically like to pay, but it is going for a good cause. Plus, for this size and quality of frame, I'm not going to find it anywhere for less than $14.99. Now, the one thing that I don't like about this frame is that it does have this green border. And I was hoping that when I took it out of the frame and flipped it over, it would just have a white background. And luckily, that was the case. So here you can see the flip side of the map board. And since it is the nice white color that I want it, I'm going to just go ahead and use that side for this project. And then to prepare my table runner, I just cut it to the desired length. And then as you can see there, uh, since this was a clearance item, it did have a lot of pulls and uh, different stray strands of weave coming through. So I just went ahead with some scissors and cut off all of those little imperfections. Next, I wanted to add some fringe to the fresh cut end of the runner. So as you can see, the other sides and end of the table runner do have a nice fringe on them. So in order to get that fringe on the newly cut end, I just took some scissors and kind of snipped there at the um, kind of the where it kind of holds it together on the side and just opened that one piece up and then was able to get a few strands free that I can begin to pull out. And then I continue to do that so that I could create the, the fringe at the length that I wanted it to be. To attach the table runner to the frame backing and the mat board, I use my favorite Gorilla mounting tape. This stuff is terrific. You can hang all types of things with it. You can buy it pretty much anywhere Gorilla Glue is sold, but I do have a link in the description if you want something quick and easy from Amazon. And so I just placed a few strips there at the top and bottom of the mat board, which has been attached to the frame backing. And then I simply put the table runner right on top and secured it in place. And then it was ready to put right back into the frame. And then wowza, I love, love, love the way this came out. This is maybe one of my favorite pieces and super duper easy to do. And coming in looking like quite the high-end piece, but only for about $20. For project two, I'm taking my inspiration from Pottery Barn and their frame rail series. I love these. They come in several different colors and styles. They even have a chain link one. It's really, really pretty. But I thought something like this one would be perfect for my son's room where I was trying to find a way to hang his collection of Godzilla, a big Godzilla fan, uh, frames. These were hanging on his wall prior to our repainting it, but we had them in a gallery format and I thought, you know what, I'm going to use these, repurpose this frame that was from a poster in his room and maybe we can create one of those frame rails. So when I made the poster frame several years ago, I used this one inch by two inch by eight foot pine board. So I just wanted to let you know what I made it of. So in case you wanted to make this and didn't have any poster frames laying around, you would know where to go. For the top rail, I'm going to be using an unfinished piece of the one inch by two inch pine board that I happen to have in my garage. Now I did cut this to 54 inches in length. And then for the down pieces, I'll be using the poster frame that I previously had painted black. And I'll be attaching the poster frame boards 
to the cross rail at 50 inches, 35.5 inches, 21 and 6.5 inches. And then this is where my favorite drill driver comes in super handy, the switch driver from Works. And look how cool this is. You just push a button and you go from drill and then it'll flip right back over to driver. Now I am just drilling that top post. Don't want to drill down into the second post. I'm going to leave that for the screw threads to dig into that, but um, you can see how easy it is and you can just quickly get the job done with one tool. And then once all of my rails are attached, I'm going to go ahead and give the entire piece a fresh coat of black paint. And then here it is attached to the wall. So how I attach it to the wall was that I drilled holes in the two ends there and then one in the middle. And luckily they lined up with studs. Had they not, I would have used some anchors. And then it's just a matter of arranging and then attaching the frames to the rails. And I am just loving the way this came out. I always loved these. I always thought they were so cool. I always wanted to make one. And I think they're just a great way to display photographs or artwork. And I can't think of a better application in our house than Matt's Godzilla fan art. For the next project, I'm going to be making some abstract art inspired by restoration hardware. I'm a big fan of abstract art, mostly because it's a quick and easy way to pull a room together and create a cohesive look by incorporating the colors used in the room into the piece. And we can definitely do it for less than $3,000. I purchased this three panel Zen art piece several years ago. It was on a clearance and the packaging it was in was all beat up. So I'm pretty sure it was seven or eight dollars it was definitely less than ten dollars but unfortunately i could never find a spot for it and it's pretty much sat in a closet for the last three or four years and although it pains me because i do like this piece i'm going to go ahead and use it for this project and the first step is going to be to cover the surface of the canvas with this caulk mastic from the dollar tree and basically i'm just kind of squirting it onto the surface and then using this putty knife to just go over the surface and spread it all around. And it's just kind of like slathering it on. It's no rhyme or reason, obviously. Um, actually the sloppier and the you know more texturized, the better. And just making sure that I'm covering all the surface. And like I said, it does pain me to do this, but I kept looking at it and saying, it's just sitting in a closet. It's going to sit there for another three or four years. So I might as well go ahead and use it. But of course you can do this with a old canvas like this or something that you picked up at a thrift store or a garage sale. And of course you can always just do this with a plain white canvas that you picked up at a craft store. And then here it is after it dried. And since it was still a little splotchy, I did decide to go ahead and give it a coat of white spray paint on top of the dried caulk. And then here is a comparison of two of the panels. The one on the left has been painted with the white spray paint. The one on the right is uh, left a little splotchy. Now I wanted to point these out because you might prefer this splotchier look for the finished effect that you're going for. For what I was trying to do, I did want a more uniform base. Now, having said that, once I got the panels into the room, I was going to place them in. I wasn't wild about that stark white color. So I did go ahead and give warm them up a bit with a mixture of this plaster with a drop or two of the cashew inside. And then I watered it down quite a bit and coated the top of the canvas. So the RH piece that I decided to use for my inspiration was the one with the large rectangle on it. And so as you can see, I already painted the large rectangle on the first two panels and I'm simply using some black paint to roughly paint the shape. And I want them to be similar, but not exactly the same. So I'm kind of roughly making them the same length and width and positioning them on the canvas in approximately the same location. But the brush strokes, density of the paint and the exact final shape will be unique to each panel. I also wanted to show you a close up of how the texture of the caulk on the canvas really helps to create a feathered static look to the paint strokes, effortlessly creating an excellent abstract look. You can play with this interaction between the paint and the texturized surface, creating thicker lines with the use of heavier paint or a more feathered look by use of a dryer brush over the textured surface. To 
create the gold accents, I'm going to be using this Folk Art Brushed Metal Gold Paint. And then again with the accenting, I'm going to be switching it up a little bit, but yet still keeping them uniform. So to keep them uniform, I'm going to be doing the accenting there along the bottom side of the rectangle, but I am placing the accenting in different locations on each of the panels along that bottom side. In addition, I'm going to be doing the upper right side of each of the panels with some of the accenting, but again, just switching it up a little bit. And then here you can see the finished project with all three panels hanging on the wall. And you can see how the texture base creates a great effect, not only for where the paint strokes are, but also along the backgrounds. The strong black and white colors are perfect for this room and cohesively pull the room together, which you will see in an upcoming video. But here is a sneak peek of how these abstract pieces blend beautifully with the framed textile art from earlier in the video. And if you're wondering, yes, both the lantern and the trough are from a previous DIY, which I will link here and in the description. For the last project, I'm taking my inspiration from this beautiful West Elm kimono wall art. However, this piece, with just some slight variations in the dimensions and finish, is less of an inspired by piece and pretty much a full-on dupe. So let's go ahead and see how I put this together. To start, I took a piece of white cardboard that I had left over from some packaging and cut it to 26 by 19 inches. A piece of foam board would also work well here. To create the shape, I used a small Dollar Tree hula hoop, then traced a line with a pencil to the inside of the hoop. Next, I cut out the shape after first measuring six inches up along the side to keep the straight edge of the cardboard there, and then began cutting the curve out at that point. So in other words, keep the bottom six inches of the cardboard straight on both sides and begin cutting the curve at that point six inches up. Next, I'm going to glue Dollar Tree white nautical rope to the cardboard, but I wanted to take a second to point out that Dollar Tree does sell two different sizes of this rope. There's a six foot and an 11 foot, and the 11 foot is a thinner gauge than the six foot, but because I want the length for this piece, I'm going to go ahead and use the 11 foot on this project. After unpackaging the rope, I wanted to get the midpoint, so I folded the rope in half, making sure the ends met on one end and creating a little loop there at the top of the other. After adding a line of glue around the top perimeter of the cardboard, I centered the loop in the middle of the cardboard and pressed it into the glue. Then I attached the rope to the glue on both sides, creating a first row there along the edge, then used the same process to create the next rows. I used a total of 12 ropes for this first larger semi-oval for the piece. And then once all 12 pieces were attached, I wanted to separate the roped portion from the rest of the cardboard while still keeping the cardboard intact. So at first I tried to cut the cardboard with scissors way up close along the bottom uh, edge of the rope, but that proved difficult. So I switched to utility knife, but that ended up cutting into the rope. So what I discovered was the best option was to cut the cardboard about half an inch away from the bottom of the rope, thereby easing, easily enabling me to remove that smaller semi-oval piece, and again, keeping it intact. And then I can go back and just clean up the edges with a utility knife and scissors, and that was much easier to do than having to do it while the larger piece was still attached. To create the smaller oval shape for the bottom portion of this piece, I used a Dollar Tree platter as the template, and again, just traced along the edge with a pencil, and then cut out the shape with scissors. Next, I began attaching the rope as I did for the larger portion, again, finding the middle of the rope and attaching it to the center of the cardboard, then gluing the sides in rows down the cardboard. And I used a total of nine of the 11 foot nautical ropes for this bottom portion. And then once all those ropes were attached, I again separated the roped portion from the non-roped portion on the cardboard. And again, I just did a rough cut to remove the majority of the cardboard and then went back and did finer cuts to clean up the edges. For the cross wood pieces, I'm going to use one and a half inch strips of balsa wood. If you're not familiar with balsa wood, it can be purchased at craft stores. And what's neat about it is that it can be easily cut with scissors or utility knife, yet still gives you a great wood look. So I'm going to take one of the balsa wood strips and heavily coat it with some of my type bond glue. Then I'll center the larger roped piece on top and then add the smaller piece in between. 
when attaching the pieces to the wood, I'm making sure the bottom edge of the cardboard is aligned with the bottom edge of the wood. Next, I'm going to take that second piece of balsa wood and again coat it with some of the tight bond glue and then lay it on top of the rope semi-ovals and line it up with the bottom piece of the wood. To secure the two edges to each other, as well as ensure a tight bond on the ropes, I'm going to wrap the wood pieces with some twine until the glue sets. Then I cut two inch strips of cardboard and I'm going to be gluing these to the back of the piece below the wood board in each section. This will prevent the rope from unwinding in that section on the front of the piece. And then it's just a matter of unwinding each strand of rope to create the thinner strands. My wonderful daughter Nikki was home this weekend and helped me with this part. We decided to just take the strands out to the initial separation, but then each of those can be further separated if desired. To hang the piece, I'm going to be using four one and one half inch finishing nails, which I'm going to place directly into the front of the piece two in each of the roped sections, and then nail directly into the wall. And then from there, you can easily trim the ends to the desired length. We decided to keep ours at 32 inches for the shorter pieces and 42 inches for the longer ones. And then here you can see the two pieces side by side. On the left hand side is the West Elm original and on the right is the somewhat dupe. As you can see the dimensions are different and that's because uh, the wall I want to place it on the piece at 48 inches would have been too wide. So I wanted to do it a little bit thinner and a little bit longer so I custom made this piece to fit the space and of course that is one of the many beauties of doing things DIY and of course the potential considerable cost savings which is definitely the case in this instance. And then here's another look at the large scale wall hangings inspired by some of our very most favorite retailers. And I hope you have enjoyed this video, these DIYs, as well as all of the DIYs from this Dollar Dupe series. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you next time on Fab Tax, where we're putting the extra and ordinary one DIY at a time.